Every creative person that I know had some inspiration in some ways that brought them into doing the creative work they ended up doing. But for so many people, you know, we, we hear these other stories, you know, the stories of either I wanted to do it since I was four years old. And we'll have some of those stories here from a few of our past guests in these little clips. So yeah, it's both. I knew I wanted to be that from a young, from a young person. Um, but we're gonna have some fun other stories that, you know, from a writer who thought she was going to be a professional athlete Olympian, an artist who didn't consider herself an artist until m much later in life, because art was just something I did to doodle on paper or to make my friends laugh, as we'll hear about. One of the things that's so, you know, that we perhaps hear more commonly is, you know, I wanted to be an artist in some way, and that led me then to this other career. So it's both fun to hear the stories of the people who had something from the very beginning and found that through line and found a way to do that. The child uh, piano prodigy who is Adrian Lee to, you know, then also like uh, Precious Brady Davis, who actually found her way into being an artist through just wanting to belong, to feel, to, to heal, to feel in the choir like she was going to heaven. And just that beautiful place that the, that, that performance brought her to. And so with that, we're going to hop right in and get little snippets from uh, quite a few wonderful artists, creatives who uh, just talk a little bit about their entryway into the fulfilling lives they have as creatives. Welcome to Tapping Creativity, the podcast for the creative community. Yes, it's a podcast for you. Whether you're looking for insight, inspiration, or community, you found yourself in the right place. My name is Matthew Temple. I am the host. And on this podcast, we go into questions, inspirations, challenges of the creative process. There it's about connecting with other artists, hearing what other people are struggling with, their wins, their challenges. If you like what you hear, make sure you subscribe, follow, share. If you really like what you hear, give us a thumbs up or give us some kind of review. And with that, let's hop into this week's episode. What was that thing early on that you that made you say, this is what I love. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go after a career in the arts, you crazy boy. And yeah, what was that inspiration like for you? I really wasn't thinking in terms of arts when I first realized that this was a fantastic thing that the world <laughs> had to offer. My grandparents had a piano. My cousins would be sort of thumping up and down on the keyboard as kids do. And I'd be trying to push them off. Because at the age of four, I had discovered sort of triads and they sounded great. And they were, you know, while well, they were sort of playing hammer and nails, you know, you know, I wanted to actually get sounds coming out of this thing. And um, very fortunately, my grandparents and my parents were, were quick to encourage this. And that piano moved very quickly from my grandparents' home to uh, my home, my parents' home. And I started a formal class. A piano training from the age of six, I think it was. Amazing. I think a lot of times there are sort of child prodigies or people who do really well end up being like there's this pressure from the outside that a lot of people end up kind of leaving that. But yet for you, you went even deeper into it. I mean, it was difficult to keep me off the instrument when I was a child. I mean, I, I, I just could not wait to get to the piano. And I would have stayed with the piano were it not exclusively, were it not for the fact that an extremely good looking young fellow arrived at my primary school when I was 10 years old and he played guitar. And that appeared to have a certain attraction for the young uh, females of that year, also at the age of 10. And I thought, right, this cannot be, <laughs> no. And, so, um, so, so, so I, basically I quickly, your- I quickly picked up guitar. So your inspiration really was the ladies. It is the story of rock and roll. Okay, yep. <laughs> and there is something about guitar that simply cannot be beat. I mean, it just is it. And um, I, I really ran those two things simultaneously. And I came at them musically, even at that age, from a very different perspective. You know, 
I had a minimal formal training on guitar. I was essentially self-taught because everything I knew from my piano education translated very well in, in such a great basis as any, you know, you'd always encourage a young musician, a really young musician, someone who wants to get into music to, to, to probably start there. I've wanted to be a writer since I was like four years old and I started learning how to like write the alphabet. <laughs> and so my mom tells the story <clears throat> That she would, I would just like be like, I want to write. And so she would just dot out like pages and pages of words and like little sentences for me. And I would just like trace them over and over. And I remember that compulsion at like four being like, I have to learn how to do this. Um, and ever since then, right, I feel like it has not changed. Right. So um, I remember writing sort of a fantasy story when I was in seventh grade and I entered it into like a library contest and it won the contest and you can still, they had it bound in like a hardback little book and you can still check it out of the Huntington Valley, Pennsylvania library. Um, and so my 12 year old self was like, I want more of this, right? I drew a lot as a kid. My parents were both journalists. So in our house, there was just, uh, there was a lot of books there. I read a lot. Um, so I, I drew comics, I read comics, I wrote, I remember like for years I published my own like fake newspaper and I would make movies and I was just in retrospect, I'm like, oh, I was just making art all the time, but I never thought I was an artist. I would be sent home from school in like first grade, my desk would be crammed with papers and my mom would be like, oh, you're, you're an artist. And I would just be like, oh, no, like I, I really had no idea what she was talking about, didn't, didn't see it as art. And then my mom, my mom also wrote children's stories. She would, she would submit to like cricket magazine and stuff. And she'd be sending something off and I'd be like, Oh, let me, let me do a drawing for you. And I would like, my dad wrote for the paper and I, I would sometimes have a drawing in the paper. Like I was trying, I was making art all the time, but I refused to see it as that I was an artist. And in, High school, I would draw to make my friends laugh because my drawings were like silly and kind of bad. So the funny part was like, this is so bad, but I drew it anyway. Can you believe that? <laughs> like making art without knowing I was an artist for my entire life. And so having this this designation, as you called it, like was a, an incredible freedom that made me feel like myself really for for kind of the first time. I went to Michigan State. I was a, a journalism and political science double major. So I thought I was gonna be a political commentator. I wanted to do documentary film, actually. I wanted to tell stories. Poetry was something I always wrote, but I never thought I could make a living doing that. No one ever, you know, poet, they're like, oh, you're gonna be broke your whole life. <laughs> you're gonna be poor. And, and sometimes I have been. And so I was a journalist first. I worked for, I actually wrote the TV news. So I would get done really early writing the newscast and then I would just be writing poems. So I was kind of moonlighting as a poet at the jazz clubs. And some of the anchors came out once and they were at this blue spot. At, at Baker's Keyboard Lounge, a very famous jazz club, actually. And they were like, what are you doing here? I was like, oh, I'm reading some poems with the band, you know. Um, so it was always something that was in me to do, but never a, a life choice, like for a career. And then so I feel like poetry really just chose me. I've always been someone who writes about the creative process and my own struggles with it and the things I've learned. And so that talk that I gave it was the biggest it was it was sort of the biggest gig I'd ever gotten. It was with the um, a, a, a community college in upstate New York. And they had asked me to talk to this group of students. And I mean, the funny thing was, is I wasn't much older than these students, really. I was probably 20, I'm 38 now. So the book came out when I was 28. So I was 27 when I wrote the talk. And I basically didn't know what to say to these people and and – I went for a walk with my wife and I said, you know, what do I say to these students? And she said, well, the best talk I ever heard when I was a student was a woman got up and said, well, here's a list of 10 things I wish I had known when I was sitting in your shoes, when I was in your seat. And I said, that's great. I'll, I'll steal that. And so I just wrote this talk that was like 10 things I wish I'd known when I was 19, you know, basically. And so, um, that went over really well, but no one filmed it and other than the audience who had it, you know, it kind of was like, okay, did this happen or not? It's the classic millennial question. <laughs> I'm an elder millennial, but 
<laughs> you know, it's like if it didn't happen online, does it exist? So I, I just turned it into a blog post, just took the slides and the text and just made it into a blog post. And that was the thing that really went viral mm. in a way back then where blog posts could go viral. And then it quickly became clear that this is going to be my next book. Actually, some of your very beginning as a writer, how did yeah. you get started and why did you decide to do this sort of crazy life as a writer? Very crazy life. I mean, I grew up actually wanting to be an Olympian. I was a gymnast. I was a boxer. I was so into just kind of health and wellness and sports. But I grew up in a very creative household. My dad's a fantastic writer. I was always writing and reading. But I believe the stereotype, like everyone else, that you can't make money as a writer. You can't make a living as a writer. It's just a hobby. And so when I decided to go to college, I was a total nerd <laughs> in high school and got all these scholarships and actually didn't want to go to college. I just wanted to go to work. But I decided to actually go to Columbia in Chicago for uh, creative writing. Uh, started off as a journalist major and switched and got a novel published when I was 22 and thought like, my life's going to change. This is, this is amazing. Terrible experience. I got totally taken advantage of. I signed with the Vanity Press. I did not know what I was doing. I did not know a thing about the publishing industry. So I took it upon myself after that to learn everything I could. I worked at a literary agency. I became a journalist on death row. I worked as a ghost writer, as an editor. And then I transitioned to writing nonfiction books and realized like, okay, I can get a traditional book deal. I can write the book, but I didn't even understand still what an author platform was and how I needed an engaged community in order to buy my book, in order to sell books. And so when I transitioned back to fiction, I was like, I'm gonna do this differently. And I learned everything I could about the business of publishing, which is what I created my business right way around because again, no one teaches us how to be authors. We can learn how to be good writers, but no one teaches us what it looks like to be a successful writer, how to advocate for yourself, how to negotiate contracts, how to understand how you get paid. Um, so that kind of like was a 20 year journey to get me here where now I work with all kinds of writers, mostly first time writers who either wanna go the self publishing route, but most wanna get the agent and the book deal. And the, the first theater theatrical production I ever saw of Alice in Wonderland. And I was so moved by the lights, mm -hmm. the color of the lights, the tone of the first uh, play I ever saw was Alice in Wonderland. And I remember that the queen in Alice in Wonderland saying, don't you, don't you, don't you dare in such an uh, authoritative tone that it was something, something that I mimicked the, the rest of my, my childhood <laughs> And then I later, I later started performing in, in community theater. And it was a place that I found belonging outside of the world of trauma, mm -hmm. you know, that I was placed right in the, the middle of. Creativity for me was a place that I found healing, singing in, in concert choir, it, it felt like I was in, in heaven, you know, hearing the soaring melodies, you know, and then it was another part of finding my voice. Right. It was another piece of my voice. Tapping Creativity is brought to you in part by We Strive, a nonprofit organization that works to lead the world towards stronger, healthier, and more sustainable community. We Strive is currently at an exciting juncture in that coming out of the pandemic, it is in a place of looking to see how can it now, as a established organization, be of greatest support to the creative communities, as well as communities who are striving in any way they know how to engage in co-creating a better world. If you're interested in learning more, visit WeStrive.org.